All right, Duncan's on. What's that? Good evening. Oh. Hey, Duncan. Oh, yeah. I got Ruthie here with hey, me. Man. Will you help sound check me here? Duncan? Yeah. Yeah. You sound good so far. All right. There we go. Yeah. You sound pretty good here, too. Um, let's see. Blanca, can you hear Duncan in the back? Duncan, say something. Hey, Blanca. All right, good. You've got her. He's on. It's going to be a Grace and Grits this weekend. It's going to be great. Nice. <laughs> I don't know if she is or not. <laughs> All right. I don't know why the picture's so dark in my camera, but it is what it is. So it's pretty clear. It's good. Yeah, it's just a little dark for some reason. <clears throat> bright lights are so bright up there. All right. Well, we're in pretty good shape. Does anyone need a, um, oh, I was going to do something really quick. Um, There's a really great photo I want to put on the screen up there. It's going to take me a minute to get this put up. We're a little early still anyway. I've got a, a little map I'm going to put up of the um, the seven churches. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll get that on the map and I'll tell you all at home what to Google. Hello, Ruth. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ruth. Hi, everybody. I'll be right back. I'm going to go put these maps on the screen. You guys can hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Yes. Hey, John. Hey, Devin. For those of us online, if uh, we like what he's saying, feel free to just clap. <laughs> <laughs> we could do celebrations. <laughs> uh oh. There we go.
still have samples that download six and then you can see the All right, everyone, we've got a nice little crew on here. I think we're ready to begin. Everybody ready? Yeah. All right. You got your Bibles? Um, I've got a few um, outline sheets. They're a little beat up, sorry, but does anybody want an outline of the course? Okay, let me see. Emily, could I get you to pass these out? You might want to say, Thank you. All right. So let me get my notes pulled up here. Thank you. See, Nina, you got the attendance board? Yeah, it's a good group online. Thanks be to God. Don't forget Ruthie's here with me. <laughs> All right, we got, yeah, we got two McCulloughs. All right, thank you, Michael. All right, now again, just for you at home, uh, just remember I, I'm looking at my notes, I'm looking at the room. If you're waving at me or something, I really can't see you because um, you're a little tiny on my monitor here. So um, if you have a question, just unmute your thing and, and ask it, just like you're in the room. Don't worry about button in or whatever, just uh, if something's not clear, or um, if you have a question about something I've said, maybe you think I said something awfully controversial and you wish me to clarify it, that's fine. Just slow down the J train and, and ask the question and we'll, <laughs> well, I'll deal with it the best I can, okay? 
uh, I'm not afraid of questions. I just, there's a lot of stuff to cover. Um, I'm open to tonight because we're doing the, the letters to the seven churches. I'm open to tonight taking a little longer um, than, than I think the other ones will. Um, just because there's seven churches that and they're each worth addressing in here. So um, there's a bit more detail in this one. So we'll uh, we'll see. Um, but I, I, I hope to have plenty of time to cover it all and to uh, have maybe a little discussion at the end. We'll see. Maybe that's ambitious, but I'm that's what I'm hoping for. All right. Well, let's um, let's pray and we'll begin. All right, Lord, Heavenly Father, what a what a privilege it is to come before you and study your word in your presence with your people. So I pray that you would open our minds and and our hearts to receive your word and that we would have our uh, our perspectives broadened and our love for you deepened and um, that we would be very intentional about how we think about and live in the lives that you've given us, even in this day and age. Um, all of it being to your glory, of course, Lord, and, and use all these experiences to conform us to your image. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. So I just want to do a little bit of review really quick at the outset here, just to uh, just sort of get you know, pump the brakes a little bit on the J train, I guess. And we'll uh, and we'll, we'll cover a little ground really quick. And um of review and then we'll get going on these on the first vision here so just a reminder some things i want you all to get out of this study remember i mentioned these at the beginning i want you to have a, a greater sense of the glory and the power and the majesty of jesus christ uh, this isn't a sort of two-dimensional flannel graph sunday school jesus we're doing here right children's storybook bible kind of a thing this is this is the son of god and all of his glory and power and might that and I want you, the more you're impressed with him, as I was trying to say on Sunday in my sermon, the more you're impressed with God, the deeper your faith will be. Because you'll have confidence in him, right? And that he's actually involved in this world and in your life. And he's able to do something and he's able to keep his promises and all these things. So I want you to have, have a greater opinion of God and Jesus Christ. I want you to have a greater conviction that there is actually a day of reckoning coming. Just like the world had a beginning, the world also will have an end. And it all started on a certain point, and it will all end at a certain point in time. And part of my job, a big part of my job, is to get you prepared for that day when you actually meet Jesus face to face. All right. Um, another one is I want you to be um, encouraged to hold fast to your faith, to cling to Jesus while you wait for him to come back. I want you to be excited about his return. I want you to cling to him and, and hold on to him, you know, spiritually speaking. Um, another reason is I, I want you to another thing I want you to get out of this is I want you will uh, I want you to have confidence that he is going to right all the wrongs. When he says vengeance is mine, you know this I will repay. I want you to believe that, and, and us to not worry about trying to take justice and matters into our own hands. Recognize this is his world. He's doing what he wants to do, and he will see it all, and all will be made right in the end. And we need to trust that. Even all the tragedies in your life, we're going to look back and say, your plan was so marvelous, God. Even in the midst of our sufferings, look back and say, you know, your plans were so marvelous. Not one of our tears was wasted. Not one of our tears that, and one of our groans has, has escaped your notice, Lord. Right? I want us to be confident in this, right? That he's going to hold the evil to account. And finally, I want us to have a great desire to share the gospel. If there are a bunch of people surrounding us and in our lives that are going to meet Jesus one day, let's make sure that they, we do everything we can to make sure they know about him and are ready. Right? Regardless of the success of our efforts, we need to tell them about this one and the gospel, the good news that he's, he's put forward in Jesus Christ. So um, those are Moses, my goals for you in this study and um just by way of reminder really quick um you know some of you are keeping up just fine but i think some of you are lagging behind a little bit or some of you are not a little bit hazy on what exactly we've been doing the last two sessions so i want to just recap really quick shouldn't take that long um but here's what we did the first week remember we we learned 
but we looked at how to approach the book of Revelation overall. The big overall picture, the approach we're taking in this class. And we noted a bunch of we, we noted a bunch of different approaches to the book of Revelation. Remember that? And uh, and essentially you can break them all down into really two general approaches to Revelation that can claim to be biblical. One would be a more historical approach where you're trying to look at all the different events in history and the different events in Revelation and sort of map it, right? You're locking it into grid points and, and this is how it all works. And this is what happened when and when, when they said this happened in Revelation. Well, that was this event here. Um, and so, the, the, but there's so much disagreement and how to match these things up. You know, it, are we waiting for all of it to happen in the future? Or has it already all happened way back in the past with the uh, destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD? Or was it the fall of Rome, right, in the 5th century? Uh, what was it, right? Um, when is the millennium? Is it literally a thousand-year reign on earth, or is it represent um, the, 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 the dead in, in heaven, you know, the departed spirits uh, in waiting in their intermediate state, or does it... Um, is it just the, the whole church age or with the beginning of it? And it's not really millennium, but it will be a reign of Christ on earth for a long, long time. There's so many ambiguous questions about what that means. Um, when is the tribulation? Will there be a rapture? When will it be? Who are the beasts? Was the beast, you know, the first beast Nero or was it the, you know, the mission or uh, maybe it was the Pope? A lot of people in the Middle Ages, especially the Reformation, thought the rise of the papacy was the rise of the beast. Um, is it Vladimir Putin? Is he the beast? Or is there going to be some sort of global elitist figure that will arise in the near future that will, you know, unite us all into one world government and, you know, the Leviathan and all this, right? What's it going to be? Um, this view is commendable because it takes the Bible seriously and it takes history seriously. And if we're going to be real Christians, we need to do both of those things. I mean, the Bible, the coming of Jesus is a very historical thing. It wasn't grounded in history. It doesn't make any sense. It has no power. It's not, it doesn't touch base with our reality. It never touches the ground, right? Um, and, and so we've got to take the Bible and history seriously. But the variety of interpretations and the way people fight about these different way to map things on the history suggests that um, it's really not as straightforward as each of these camps think. Now, it's possible that one is more right than the rest or whatever. I'm not saying that's not logically the case, but I think that the, the amount of disagreements over it, how difficult it is to do this suggests that maybe um, it's not as easy as people tend to think. They, they land on one sort of read and how to do it, and that's just what they stick with, their camp, and that's it, right? You're familiar with that kind of thinking about all kinds of stuff, yeah? Yeah. Um, even if it's just like how to load the dishwasher. <laughs> you get set on your one way of doing it, right? And that's it. And everybody else who does it differently is an idiot. And you got to redo it when they, after they load it, right? Thanks for your help. Can't wait till they get out of here so I can redo it all, right? <laughs> um, and then there's still like, and if you, ladies are, yeah, absolutely. Get out of the kitchen, man. And then you've got these, and then you've got the, the timelines. If you, so if you start with, you know, Revelation, um, you know, with the, the the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost, all right, the beginning of the church age, and then you got Jesus coming back, and, and everything from Revelation 3 to Revelation 22 is all in this one big string of time, you know, a big timeline, one after the other in sequential events. There's a lot of these things that seem to repeat themselves, and it just doesn't make sense to a certain reading. Uh, to I think it, it's just a fair, honest reading. It's like, wait a minute, I thought everybody died already, but now there's more people to judge again. It, it just some things don't quite logically add up if you're looking at it as just a single timeline. And so that's why I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to teach you a certain perspective on this book. Uh, we could get bogged down, you know, if we were to try and do a firm timeline. I'm going to do my best to put one together for us by the end. Here's the way I think things will go. All right. That's just my, you know, there are ability of others of these too so it's just my humble offering to you okay at the end we'll do that but i don't want to get bogged down in the details of the events right now and when things will go um 
because we could just argue about that all that kind of minutia and never get anything accomplished. I don't think it's as edifying. Another reason is, um, you know, I could try and break down, okay, this view teaches this about Revelation, and this view teaches this about Revelation, and this view teaches this about Revelation, um, sort of in an objective kind of a way, just to present you all the scholarship and opinions on the book of Revelation. I think that belongs more in an academic classroom. I think that's not the best approach in many respects for a study in a church. Not that we can't study all those things and benefit from them, but at the end of the day, you've got to land on something that we actually think and believe. You can't just be fair and present all the viewpoints as equal. I, no, I think some are better than others, right? And, and so let's just go for it, because I think this is a really good and edifying view. And so that's why I want to lay out this one particular view for you. Um, and, and I just want to really understand Revelation the best that I can, and I want to share it with you. That's, that's my motivation, all right? Um, as someone who knows you and is trying to guide you in the ways of Christ. Um, and part of it, too, is just I'm your rector and you're stuck with me. This is what I think about Revelation. So this is what you're going to get. All right? This privileges of the, of the position, you know. Um, even if you don't agree with me, though, and you, 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 let's say you've been a student of Revelation for a long time. There's a few of you in here that I could find you've been thinking about this for a while. I, I would believe that. Um, and let's say you disagree with my read. That's great. That's fine. As long as you believe that history matters and the Bible is true, right? And you're doing your best, that's all I ask. Um, however, I do ask that you just be open to learning about this view and my interpretation and in ways in which it challenges you in your reading. That's great. It'll make you more articulate and more thoughtful about your opinion, right? Um, and people who are truly secure in the knowledge always enjoy a good challenge. Anyway, so I think that I hope this is just to strengthen you um, if you have strong opinions or you're open, right, in your faith. Um, so the idealist approach, which is the one that I hold and many others that I, I very highly respect, doesn't deny the historical, but it views the letter of Revelation as a series of, remember, it's seven visions that portray sort of a multi-camera angle of the one. Remember the other now of the of the one timeline of the you know the church age, from Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming, and so we have seven different perspectives of this one timeline. So it's like telling the story seven different times, right? And then these all inform and educate one another. And it's like hearing in three D or something or seven dimensions or whatever you know. You get to see multiple um, camera angles on the whole thing. Or remember the um, slide the, the projector. Um, analogy, right? You got the one projector sheet with the, you know, whatever what do you call the, the overhead projector with the, what was the, the transparency that was down there? Yeah. So you sketch out one and then you, you put another one on top and you sketch out the other story and they overlay one another and then it creates this more beautiful whole. It's kind of like in a visual sense, hearing in stereo, right? You got, you got your, your Dolby surround sound going on uh, with the book of Revelation, all these different images. Um, and so this view respects the history, but it sits a bit loose in the precise applications of the progression of the story um, as far as mapping it onto history. But I definitely affirm that the final conflict of Christ will come in the future, maybe the near future, I don't know. But it, it is all historical and real. But I also think that we, um, the, the, the various judgments that are outlined in the book, I think they come in different places and different times and different ways throughout the history of the church age in, different, in each generation. So I think these things are realities that are constantly playing out um, in, in the life of, of the church in this world. I think there have been lots of beasts and lots of antichrists through the last 2,000 years. Yeah, we've probably got a few that are participating in the spirit of antichrist right now. So I'm not denying the realities. I'm just saying I think there can be multiple fulfillments of it as the time goes on, yeah? Uh, it's more of a spirit of it, you know? Uh, and then who's participating in that? Um, uh, final judgment, of course. Uh, but there's no way we can tell when. So if you're hoping for, to get my prediction on when Jesus is going to return, so you can blast it over social media and say, this is what my pastor says, you know, sell all your stocks and give them to him. And Harold Camping, this crazy guy did that about 15 years ago or so, if you remember that. It was nuts. Anyway, um, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll do the timeline again, my best guess at it, 
in this sort of end times um, by the end of the course. But John gives us a basic summary of what it's all about in chapter 1. Just a few verses. He explains the whole, he lays out the whole timeline right here for you. Uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. I'm looking at Corinthians. Yeah, that's right. I was like, why is that not reading right? All right. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. So here comes the timeline. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. There's the cross, right? And he made us kingdom, priests to his God and Father. That's Pentecost. And when you and I came to believe in the church age, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's eternal. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Behold, now, now we jump to the end. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all tri tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. There's the end right there. And then the eternal comes in again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You've got the whole outline of the book right there. you got the cross. You've got making a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and, and, and those who believe in Jesus. And you've got him coming again. And the whole time you get a couple of reminders that he he's, has dominion forever and ever. You see how that, that's such a tidy little summary of the timeline of the of the church's existence. Just right there. And so that that's that's it right there. You could almost close the book, right? <laughs> After a few verses. Uh, it's all complete. Um, so that was all the first week. So just getting our, our approach to the book in view. Now, last week, we went on to discuss the context for the book of Revelation, a different context. Right? One, we had the, uh, um, the, the biblical context, right? So we wanted, to, we wanted to know how does Revelation fit and jive with the rest of the Bible? Remember we talked about that? And that's why your Bible reading came in handy. Hopefully you're able to do that. Some of you were like, scrambling to keep up with it all because it's a lot of reading and I make no apologies for making you read your Bible a lot. So just do the best you can. Um, nobody's going to shame you or kick you out if you don't get it all done, but do your best to at least skim it. Um, and especially important to read Old Testament prophecy because we see this beautiful harmony of, the, of the, the revelations that are given to the prophets and John is one of them. Um, you know, Revelation, the book of Revelation is an opening of things that were closed to the other prophets. So it's kind of the completion of prophecy. One scholar says that Old Testament prophecy is kind of like being in a dark room. You can, like I say, we turn all the lights out here, right, and had paper over the windows or something. You could make out some things, right? There's a chair here and a table here, whatever, right? You could, you could discern some things, but then you turn the lights on, and you can see everything clearly. And that's how Revelation is compared to the other prophecies in the Bible. And I thought it was a helpful way to explain it. And Christ, of course, is the light. The advent of Christ and the revelation of the Spirit is the one who opens our eyes even to understand what's in all these prophecies. And, and Revelation is the one that brings it all together. Um, and then we talked about the role of the New Testament, especially outside of Revelation. Revelation is full of symbolic coded things, right? It's really hard to understand what all these mean, what all they refer to. That's why, because it's ambiguous, we need plainer spoken, more clear parts of Scripture to understand how it all goes and works so that we can then bring that to the book of Revelation to help us understand. So when something in the Bible is difficult, we go to the parts that are easy to understand. We learn it all there, and then we take that knowledge back to the difficult bits. Does that make sense? So that's the goal in reading. That's the New Testament context. And then we looked at the condition of the church who received this letter. Now, the letter I'll affirm throughout this, the book of Revelation was meant for all Christians in all times. You and me, 
included. But we also need to recognize the fact that it was written to certain people at the end of the first century AD. And there are some things in there that will be particular to them and the images used and that kind of thing, maybe even a few events, right? So we got to recognize the people to whom it was written. And we have to understand what was their life like? What was the political world in which they lived? What was it like to be a Christian in 95 AD? Right? What was it like? What concerns did they have? What was happening to them? Why was this letter so welcome and encouraging to them? And remember, we saw that the church in those days was persecuted. It was oppressed. And they were suffering for their testimony to Jesus Christ. They, they were first, the, the spirit of the world, the spirit of the dragon and the beast, and all that first oppressed them through the Jewish establishment. Now, I'm not saying that all Jews are, hate Christians and hate God, whatever, but there were many that did not receive, and today do not receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? And the spirit of the world and of the evil one is, is operating in them in as much as they're opposing the church. I'm not saying all Jews are bad or evil or whatever. There are plenty of people who be plenty of Jews who became Christians or are on their way to becoming Christians, and I'm sure there'll be lots of Jews saved in the end. So it's not about Jews. It's about um, these. They happen to be the first people of the world to attack the church, right? And then when they became distinct, when the Christians became distinct from the synagogue, because it used to be people arguing in synagogues, yeah about the Messiah and about Jewish things. And then eventually the church separated from the synagogue and became its own meeting altogether. And then later on, it came on the radar of the Romans. And that's why we read the persecution accounts. And, you know, Pliny, the governor, is writing to the emperor saying, what do I do with these people? You know, here's what I've done so far. If I've done rightly in your view, what should I? Give me some advice, right? A nice little memo from our governor to the emperor. Um, and you know, and I read those excerpts of persecution. We're gonna we're gonna meet um, Ignatius of Smyrna, or Poly, Polycarp of Smyrna. I mean, and Ignatius. They they were from that church. In one of the churches that the letter is written to is Smyrna. They would have heard the first reading of this letter. Clement of Rome. There's no letter in Revelation to Rome, but Clement of Rome tells us what it was like to be a Christian in the first century at the very time probably within a few years of when Revelation was just written and distributed. He writes an account remember of how they were treated and so we can learn what it was like. So that's why I read all those excerpts so you could understand what the church's life was like when they received this letter. And, and it's interesting um, you can see the same kind of language in John here remember in chapter 1 verse 9. John is an apostle. They all would have known who he was. He was the last living apostle. He was like the grandfather of the church, and he was the leader of the whole world, Christian world at this point. He would have been the one everybody looked to at this time. And he doesn't introduce himself as an apostle, like Paul will do. He says, I, John, and he chooses to identify with them as a brother. He says, I'm your brother in Christ. I'm not the apostle, even though he was. He introduced himself as a brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Christ Jesus. He says, I am I'm suffering too. We're in this together. And here's what the Lord showed me to show to all of you. you know, I, I'm, an, I'm an exile on this island, not a pleasant place to be. Um, it's, I understand it's a fairly civilized place today, Patmos, but... Back then, it was a prison colony, a prison island, and it would not have been a lot of luxuries or comfort at all. Um, and he says, I'm there on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so this letter is given to a persecuted church through a persecuted apostle to encourage them all to hold on to the end. Remember, this is the uncovering. This is sort of a peek behind the curtain, the spiritual reality, the reality of things. Rather than just what your eyes can see, what is going on behind the scenes, right? And we saw, too, that their world, the Roman world, was religious through and through. And so the Romans had their traditional religions. They were the conservatives. 
And we were the radical upstarts with this supposedly newfangled thing, right? And we were oppressed and, dis and, and persecuted because of it. And it was, the religious conflicts were open and, and it was dangerous and tense because there was high stakes, right? But I want to suggest to you that our world is perhaps more dangerous and tense than theirs was when it comes to Christianity. Why do I say that? Well, ideological and political movements that now pretend to be secular and neutral and about science and, and democracy and all this, they're duplicitous. The human heart is religious through and through. It's kind of like the, my favorite line I heard about atheists is they say, I don't believe in God and I hate him. <laughs> Either way, athe why do they care so much that they do believe in God? Right? Atheists can be so nasty and aggressive about it. It's like, if you think it's just like a big unicorn in the sky or something, right? Or some old man that we're worshiping that doesn't exist, a figment of our imagination. Why do you care? Just leave us to our delusion, right? But no, there's this built-in sense of... Of God, I, I found this uh, an article here. Um, it illustrates, to my mind anyway, this inherently religious sense of things. And uh, it's there's this publication called the Free Press. It's an online um, newspaper, sort of an alternative media, trying to be fair and objective. And they they have all kinds of stuff in there, but um, really interesting stories. And this one story that was just I don't know if it's published. Yeah, it's published today. Can you find God in a bikini? And there's this movement in California called um, Secular Sabbath. So they're pretending not to be religious, not of this, but you know they're going to be creative and they're going to find God on their own. Like, why do they? Why do they bother with the whole God thing still? And it's full of stories. That, like, well, I grew up in the church, but it didn't mean anything to me. You know, I want to find God on my own way, my own terms, and all that. Um, here's the intro. A woman dressed in a kimono tiptoes between the tattooed limbs of about 50 people lying on the floor of a spa in, in West Hollywood. So sort of making your way through all these people that are laid out on the floor. They're in the home stretch of a breathing exercise that's lasted 20 minutes. By now, they've become one organism, breathing to the rhythm of a jungle beat on the stereo, their stomachs rising and falling like a hive mind. At the end of this, the instructor prepares the crowd. We're going to have the opportunity to create sound, to move what needs to be moved. And so they start like chanting these mantras or like screaming or making animal noises, all this random stuff. And, um, and let's see, I'm gonna find you a couple of quotes here. It's called Secular Sabbath. And, uh, and it says here, uh, The purpose of secular Sabbath sessions is to connect a couple hundred members, is what they have, to a higher power at a time when attendance at religious services across the country is dwindling. So as churches go down, groups like this are springing up, people still looking for a higher power. She says, the leader of this group says, I hope they connect with a sense of purpose through God or something greater than just themselves in this world. In other words, even though Americans are increasingly giving up on church, they're still looking for God, even in a sauna. This one woman who's there who was raised Jewish says she rarely goes to temple now, but still finds God all around her. And on and on it goes to stories like this, Jews and Christians and others who, right? Um, they've left the church behind, but they can't help themselves. They're still looking for something, yeah? And it's sad because they're making it up as they go, and they're all completely random. You know, I don't. You know, I, I think it's one one woman says in here, "Why well, I don't like to think of God as some big old, old man in the sky who tells me what to do." I'm like, well, that's inconvenient. <laughs> you know how to be and what to do and all this. And anyway, um, I just thought that was a really timely example. It's really interesting. So, uh, but they. Have a, they all universally have a hostile attitude and posture towards traditional religion like us. 
because they want to do it in their way. Right? They want to reach God and find God on their terms. Does that sound familiar? It's like the Garden of Eden all over again, right? And they, they, they're pretending they're, they're, it's all new, right? Like, the, you know, we're in a sauna and it's, it's kind of hot and steamy. The, the photograph on there is of like all these young people together in a sauna stripped down to their underwear. And, um, and they're all just sweating it out and having a good time and singing songs and all this. And, and there's probably some incense, probably a good bit of drugs involved and some sex too on the side. And, and they think they're so creative. And I'm like, guys, this is so first century AD pagan temple. <laughs> You're doing the same thing our Greek and Roman ancestors used to do. Right? And they're, they're, they're in these temples with dark things and candles and, and rhythmic music and some hallucinogens and some sex and, and the whole thing. And they're connecting with God, right? Like, that is so 2,000 years ago. <laughs> but they think they're all novel and new and brave and stuff. And it's the same pagan, it's the same spirit, the same pagan animus that's filling them. It's, it's filling the void left by their rejection of the idea of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what the, the, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And so when there's a vacuum of the, of the presence and the knowledge and the respect, the honor of God, other spirits are dying to go in and fill that. And that's what's going on. You know, and then I had a rough, rough experience just this last week um, with, with a, a sort of non-Christian sort of religious group, right? Maybe she'll tell you about it sometime. She's still shaken up by it. It was really disturbing. Um, Nature abhors a vacuum. Dark spirits will gladly go in. They always go in where the knowledge and the honor of God and worship of God has gone out. There's no neutral space in this world. Uh, we have to have our guard. We have to have our eyes open. We have to be on our guard to understand what spirits are animating this world that will go in and seek to fill this void. The things that are combating against why do you feel discouraged in some day you think it's just chemicals in your brain there's more to it than that why do you struggle with depression or anxiety there's more to it than just chemicals in a mood all right we are surrounded by spiritual realities we have to be on our guard we have to have the help of god's word to educate us and inform us on what's going on what we're facing and how to beat it yeah Um, that's why, for example, later this fall, I'm doing a class on wokeness so we can see in greater detail just one example of, of how the same spirits that were operative, that we learn about in Revelation are operative today, All right? So um, the true church will always be opposed by these hostile spirits. We have to be awake, keep our head in the game. That's why John opens the letter for us this way. We've got to engage the word of God. So... Interestingly, there are seven blessings given throughout the book of Revelation. And you get three of them at the outset. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, who just voices them forth in the church. And in this, this is a time when most people were illiterate. Maybe they could like make out like an inventory list or some, you know, business related kind of stuff. But this kind of literature was, was beyond their reading ability. And so hearing it in church would make all the difference in the world. That's the only way they had to learn and take it in. Right. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. It's an important ministry, just reading the Bible. We take it for granted today because we have it printed on our bulletins and we can read along. Right. But reading the word of God is a vital ministry. Um, he says, blessed are the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it. And who keep what is written in it. So hearing it and then showing that you've actually heard it, it's not going out one ear in one ear and out the other. It settles in the heart, and then we do it. We keep it. So the reading, the hearing, and then the keeping of God's word, there is blessing in this, he says. There's a threefold blessing here. The victory is won. We think through political might or whatever. It's not. It is through hearing and receiving the word of God and the testimony of the saints. And the, our lives, even our deaths, are the real power and the real thing by which we win, win the victory over the forces of darkness. And so we'll get into how that is uh, demonstrated and illustrated in the book of Revelation. Um, 
It's about our lives and our testimony. So that, that's sort of our recap of the introduction. Any, any questions about that so far? Any thoughts? Yeah, there's seven blessings. Yeah. Well, there are lots of blessings in the in Matthew, you know, five through um, eight or whatever it is. But um, yeah, it's interesting that there are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. That's good. Any other thoughts or comments or questions on the last couple of weeks before we... Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I can do it verbatim because that was me just. But the uh, no, our victory is not won through through human might or through our plans or our scheming or whatever. It is won through our, the power of the word, the power of the truth coming out of us. Right. And that's why you can see the weakness in the hostile powers when they get violent and they destroy bodies. That proves that they've lost the battle of truth. When there is like, you know. When the first person to hit the other in a conflict is the one who loses, right? At least, at least loses the battle of truth. And so in the end, Jesus will also physically finish the deal. But the way in which we defeat the forces around us is through the Spirit of God speaking His truth through us. So it is our witness to the truth, both in our spoken words and our testimony, and even through our death. Nothing spoke a more eloquent word than Polycarp's death, you know? The things that he said, the way he suffered, and the way he died. It was a riveting, undeniably powerful victory over the forces of darkness. And the world says, oh, that old man lost. Right? Now he's dead. He didn't lose. And he's going to be vindicated in the end. So, yeah. That's my restatement of, yeah. All right. You ready to jump in? Let's do it. All right, so we've already read um, John's intro of himself. So verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So whenever there's a trumpet going, going for, sounding forth in the Bible, it is, is to get your attention, to gather you around, and to communicate something very important. It's very loud and undeniable. So he heard this sort of ancient summons to, you know, as a Jew, it would have been his heart language kind of a thing, you know? Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, the walls fell, the blasting of the trumpets, right? It's the wrath of God falling on, on that city, right? And then, then when, you know, and then, then when God came down on Sinai, they heard the blasting of trumpets to sound like that. You know, so it's, this goes along with, this is the same spirit, the same kind of thing. And he's on, it's on the Lord's day. Some people say, oh, it means the day of the Lord, the very last day when Jesus returns. No, he's talking about a Sunday. He's praying on a Sunday morning. He's not a Sunday morning. And then you know that. That was not, he did not keep a Sunday Sabbath. And you know that. Yeah. Yeah. So he was on a Sunday morning on the Lord's day. And, um, and he hears a voice like a trumpet. And so this wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been physically picked up. You know, it's like when, uh, when Daniel has a vision. I forget the reference right now. This is just sort of off the cuff. But when Daniel has a vision, the Lord, when the word of the Lord comes to him, um, and he's in the presence of the Almighty, spiritually speaking, he's in the room with these other guys. So he's still physically there. But these other men get a sense of what's going on in Daniel. And what the, the Lord, the glory, the power of the Lord is descending on that man. And it says they fled the room in terror. They couldn't even be in the same room as, as, as Daniel experiencing one of these visions, right? And so the, the power of God descends and, and sort of he's taken away in the spirit and shown all these things. So he's sort of lifted up out of literally an ecstatic experience where his, his mind and his consciousness and his awareness is literally lifted out of his body. Or maybe it's all put into his body. You know, there's all things are just poured into him. However it works, who knows whether he's taken up or it all goes inside him. Um, you know, heaven and, and the, the spiritual realm doesn't take up space like we're used to thinking of three-dimensional space. So who knows how this works? Um, we'll know someday. 
or if you ever have a revelation straight from God, number one, I'll doubt it, but let's say it's legit. <laughs> um, the, you can, maybe can tell us, but um, it's just tongue in cheek. I don't think you're going to have one. Um, then he says, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Then he lists off Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so I've got the map up there of all these cities. Okay. We'll talk about these in a little bit. Um, and then he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Um, this is, of course, Christ. And the, the lampstands, you know, this is sort of in the, in the heavenly temple where Jesus is. And there's seven golden lampstands. In the earthly temple, there would have been one lampstand with seven lights on it. The menorah, right? Now, this one has seven lampstands. And each one stands independently in its region. And it is the light of the world. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world, right? And so the church being his body, as a lampstand, is a symbol of their calling, is to shed forth the light of Christ in their community. So us being united to him, he works through us to get the word of God out and the glory of God out into the world. Yeah. This is an important little phrase here in 13. And in the midst of the lamp stands, there is one like a son of man. I think the location of Jesus here in the middle of the lamp stands is important. What does that suggest? Jesus is with the churches. He's in the midst of the life of the church. And of course, he's all glorious. And, um, you know, it's like he said in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them, right? And what is this like to have, you know, we think, oh, he's sort of with us and he's listening in or whatever. No, it says he's standing in the midst, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash, Around his chest and the hairs of his head are white like wool, like snow. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice is like the roar of many waters. There's a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. He's holding the seven stars of the church in his right hand. You know what I mean? This is the one who's in the midst of us when two or three are gathered together. It's a different image, isn't it? That's not just your buddy Jesus sort of listening in, like you see on the murals at like Adventist Hospital or something, right? Sorry, Brent. <laughs> yeah, the little like where Jesus is like leaning over the surgeon and telling him what to do or whatever, you know. I mean, those are cute. Those are nice, but they're kind of silly. But that's not how this is. This is Christ standing in the midst in his glory and in you know, fullness and his power. And, um, and it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I mean, the, the overwhelming presence of, of Christ and John being in it, you know. Is too much. Um, Matthew 28, 20. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He said this, right? This is what this symbolizes. Um, so he is among the church. Kind of think of it this way. As your soul is among the members of your body, keeping it animated and alive. Right? And, and he's among the members of the church. He's among the church to, to care and to tend take care of and also there he's also sometimes you think of it like a garden he's pulling weeds and killing pests you know he means business one author puts it this way you know he says I'm, I'm coming to purge the churches so to purify and to punish those who persecute and afflict his beloved children and then I pointed this out in a sermon my sermon on transfiguration when I saw him, I felt his feet as though dead. Remember John on the mountain of the transfiguration? Jesus then reached over and touched them and said, fear not. And here he does it again. He reaches over and touches them and says, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. So he died once, he'll never die again. It's impossible to kill him. 
He says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Like talk about fearing now. Like he, he, he determines when people go in and he determines when people come out of death. He's in complete control over it all. And he says, so write what you've seen. The things that are and those that are take place after this. I'm not sure exactly what he means there. And then he explains explicitly the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, the question here is, the angels of the seven churches, are those like guardian angels? Or you know, an angel just means messenger, really? So I think the more reasonable explanation is also because, you know, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this, like angels don't need letters written by people. Right? I think they're talking about me. I'm the messenger from God to tell you the gospel, to tell you the things of the word of God and, and all of this, right? So he's talking about people like me, elders of a church who, who come and I feel the weight of it right now as I'm saying all this stuff. Um, and so this letter is to all of us through people like me. And we're in this together. I'm an individual with a certain responsibility, and I'm among you as a brother, as your brother in Christ. Um, and so the elders in the church, the presbyters, we nickname priests now, um, they and overseers, bishop, they're the ones who are, are specifically singled out in this um, uh, from among the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he says, the seven stars are the seven angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And as we know, um, there were, you see the churches on that map. If you're at home, just on, on your computer, Google um, seven churches revelation map, and you'll see a map. You can sort of follow along with us. If you're at home, you might Google that and, um, and see what we're talking about. We've got a, a, mess, a map on here that I thought was pretty clear it's a little small maybe can you all see that okay it's not too bad yeah so it's written to all, there are obviously a lot more churches in the world than those you know what i mean i mean forget the most important churches like like in antioch or or down in jerusalem of course or in uh in, in, in rome whatever right so there have been a lot more churches but this is sort of a sample and i think the fact that they're in it they make it makes a circular route and as and as the letters unfold, you see Ephesus is the first letter, and then it goes around the circle clockwise, the, the writing of the letters. And so it's been suggested that maybe this is like a Roman mail route where the letters would have been delivered in this way, right? As they were going along, so first you go to Ephesus, then you go to Smyrna, then you go to Pergamum, then Thyatira, etc. And so they're going around. All of those are in an area that's about a roughly 100 miles from Patmos, you can see the little bottom left there, Patmos is pointing that little island that's just off the coast of Turkey. You can go there today. It's a Greek island. Um, you can see Turkey from there, I think. Um, it's not that far. And it's about 100 miles. It's kind of like from our new Smyrna, right, to Tampa or something. It's not any farther than that. It's like central Florida. That's central Florida, basically, geographically speaking about the distance. There's not that big an area. And they're all within close distance to where John is, having this vision of Patmos, where he's in exile. It's interesting to think about that, isn't it? I find it interesting. And it's, but I think the circular nature of it all that is sort of going around, and it's the whole, it's the whole church that's represented there. The seven being the number of completion and perfection. And the circular nature of it is, to me, it's all the churches in the, in the world that are represented here symbolically through those churches. They just happen to be sort of his case studies that he chose to teach the church these different lessons. That Jesus chose these churches. And, um, and, and they're, they're, they're illustrative of the state of the church generally. Yeah? So, let's see here. This message to the churches um, provides a foundation for the rest of the visions sort of kind of comes back to it um, a lot. And uh, no doubt these letters address real issues and situations in those churches you see on the map. Um, 
But yet, they, as I was saying earlier, they, they are also universal issues that all churches will struggle with at one time or another, all congregations and, and regional churches. Um, and so, and this is true of all the New Testament, right? Otherwise, like, oh, the book of Romans, and people will do this kind of stuff. The book of Romans was written to people in Rome back in the first century, and it's not really relevant to us today. It's a different time, different place, et cetera, right? That's garbage. <laughs> yeah, it's written to them. That's the occasion. But the truth that it conveys is timeless, and it's for the whole church. Yeah, as if Rome hoarded their letter and they didn't share it with the neighboring cities. Or, of course, they copied it and sent it out to everybody else to share it because it was for the whole church through that one city. Right? And so this is the same dynamic. Um, otherwise, we just wouldn't even bother, bother with the Bible, would we? If it was just written for Jewish people or Greek people or whatever, right? A long, long time ago. Um, and so, and this was meant to be circulated through. It's, you know, what he says to the church is, right? It's, and so each of them would have read the letter. So, so loud I see it would have read Ephesus's letter, you know? That's right, yeah. And so they're all reading it. Um, and so it was for all of them, and you know some certain some letters, some for some more for some than for others. But um, here's a challenge for us, all right. As we start in with these letters, you and I as individuals are addressed in at least one of these letters in a challenging way. All right, these are Jesus exhortation and encouragement and challenge to you and to me as individuals. So we need to hear. As, as he says at the end of each letter, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says that in every one of them. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. We need to be humble. We need to receive this. It's a big challenge for us. There's no way we're going to get through these tonight. But that's okay. We'll do part B. This is part A. Part B next time. Um, so in each of these letters, let's notice a basic pattern, okay? There is a reminder of, number one, there's a reminder of an aspect of Jesus from John's encounter with him that we just read. And each aspect of Jesus that's told has a direct relationship to the letter that church is getting, to their issues. So there's an attribute of Jesus being applied to their specific situation. For example, in Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's not all the attributes of Jesus we just heard about, but it is some of them, right? So he's applying certain aspects of Christ to the church. Um, that's one. Another one, there's a description of the church's setting in each one. I know your works, your toil. I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're going through. I know what you're doing and what you're up to, right? Um, and all of, and five of them, there is a challenge, sort of a rebuke. Uh, you know, this is the, I have a problem with you, right? Five of the seven get that kind of a word. Um, the ones that have rebukes, they all have a call to repentance. Or the ones that don't have a rebuke, they have a call to perseverance. So there's a call, Jesus is calling each of the churches to perseverance, and if necessary, repentance. And he ends with a promise to the church, to the one who overcomes, I will give this. And he gives this really cool list of things, right? If, when you add them all up, all the churches, all the different gifts that the believers get if they persevere. It's not, you know, so it's not like the ones in Ephesus would, would be the only ones who get to eat of the tree of life, for example, right? No, they, every Christian will. It's just uh, what he chose to apply in that situation, a reminder, yeah? So, and then, he, and then he'll always at the end of these things, whether it's the very last or not, um, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So everybody has to listen up to what's said to each church. All right, it's eight o'clock.
any thoughts? We'll do, let's do Ephesus tonight and then we'll do the rest next time, okay? We'll do the first letter. Any thoughts so far? Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, good. Chapter 10, yeah. With the, with the guys leaving the room in terror. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's all very Emily saying even you read it there in Daniel, but it's not obvious that he's talking about Jesus. That's what was revealed to him. And he just saw this one like a son of man, etc. And he knew he was in the presence of the Almighty, but how this works and what it means was was shadowy and not clear, not made totally explicit. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. So we're meant to read our Bibles backward in many ways. <laughs> because once it's made clear in the New Testament, then we could go back and say, ah, oh, that's what they were talking about back here in the Old Testament. Oh, so Daniel saw Jesus in some mysterious way, right? And you know, and so once you take these things in the New Testament that are made clear, right, then you can go back in time and read the parts that are less clear. And then that's one of the secrets of unpacking the Bible's harmony and seeing Jesus throughout the whole Bible. Right? It's always been him <laughs> engaged from the beginning before the beginning and that was that's good any other thoughts or comments questions something not clear to you at this point or what's going on here anybody want to ask that one no okay <laughs> mail route yeah. okay the pony express yeah the stagecoach Right. You know, John was, I, I think John was familiar with these churches personally. Like he spent some time there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it was Ephesus that he spent some time in personally. Jerome tells us that a few centuries later, but the memory is still living in the church. Um, and so I think these are just places where he had been maybe recently. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there, I think he was familiar with the region personally. And yeah. Yeah. Or why didn't he do like Rome, you know, you know, Ephesus, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria? That would have been a more universal. Are. Well, yeah, that, that's true. They wouldn't get the letter for quite a few months, right? It's been a few weeks and months before they get the letters, but uh, yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. You'd have to ask John when you get there. Yeah, Felix. I mean, maybe, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know. I mean, it, it was for Jerusalem, too. So I, I don't know was the geographic specificity here. I don't know. Paul, I thought you were saying was always one of the disciples, right? Uh huh. He was in the spur. Mm -hmm. Maybe this church is, like you say, he knew them and yeah. he knew him as an elder. I, I think maybe, yeah, maybe writing this to these churches, which he had more recent experience with. Um, 
he was able to write this these letters in a way that would dig a little bit and really speak to their context sort of in a representative kind of a way. Does that make sense? So he pastorally knew what they were going through in recent times. And so he could address these to these churches in that way, maybe. That's just speculation on my part, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, Rick had a... That's right, yeah. Yeah, Jesus picked the churches, yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? That's right. I don't, I don't know. It's not obvious that there is. I mean, all we have is the book itself, you know what I mean? The clues that we can find within it. And there doesn't seem to be, other than just noticing that it does do a sort of progression around the circle there, so to speak. But that's just something we notice. It's not, it doesn't say why. There could be more that could be discerned. And, and if you really think about it, um, in some kind of like three or four dimensional way, you know, what's going on here? Maybe they're meant to build on one another or, well, I don't know. I don't know. Candy, you had a. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It is perfect. Yeah. And and it also does do, do testify to the fact that God works through human vessels for the revelation of the word. And so human personality and human experience is not absent from it. Right. So like Paul, there's a lot of things that he was dealing with in these churches, like Corinthians, especially. Right. Or Galatia that were. That were really, um, really challenging and pastorally challenging, but God speaks to the whole church through the specific instances of His apostles or His servants in those contexts. You know, so it's both and. and that John didn't determine it, but God spoke through that circumstance to the rest of the church. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, there were also more impressive cities you could have written to in a human sense. So uh, where, where better to distribute from the whole world or to the whole world than from Rome or like Alexandria, you know? So I don't know. Things to ask. Joda, you had a thought or a question? Oh, okay. Just look at her. She's like backpedaling. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. Well, as we go through these, we'll, we'll just do Ephesus. We'll just do Ephesus tonight. Um, I really, if we're going to get the things that I think Christ would have us get, if we want to be blessed in hearing and the keeping of this prophecy, right? We need to take it to heart that these letters are written to you and me. And sometimes Jesus will say things to you through this book that might sting or you might want to deny. You can trust him, all right? And I'm not going to pick anybody out. I like to pick on Lynn in here, but I'm not going to pick her out for these things, all right? Um, but my prayer is that Christ will speak to you through the hearing of this book and that you will receive it. As, as, as he'll tell one of the churches, I think it's Thyatira, no, it's loud. I see it. He has nothing good to say to them. But yet he does express his love for them. Right? It's all negative, just critical stuff. But he's, you know, I, 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 I love you, he's saying to them, right? Even if it's all like, oh, conviction and oh, man, um, he loves you. And that's why he's doing it for your salvation. And he wants to draw you close to himself. The Holy One of Israel wants to draw you close, you know, and purify you. So hear what's in it and receive it um, for what it is. Yeah. That's right, yeah. That is the point, yeah.
Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And there are some really stiff challenges. Basically, it's going to be like, I'm not sure any, hardly any of you are going to make it into the kingdom. I mean, it's very serious stuff. And he doesn't hold, he's not compromise. He's, you know, and so this is written to people that are in these churches. Many of them aren't believers, but I think Christ is still addressing them anyway. You know, they're not actually believers, you know. They don't truly know it. But he gives this word anyway to them to, to get them to examine themselves and, you know, and, and come to him. So, um, all right, here we do. We'll do Ephesus and then we'll, uh, then we'll quit for the night. All right. There are some really helpful headings that um, one author did, a guy named Joel Beakey. Some of you might know them, recognize the name of it. Felix does. You know that name? Joel Beakey? No? Yeah. Oh, they love Mitt Ligonier and all that. Anyway, um, yeah, he's a good guy, really faithful. He's a Presbyterian guy. And he wrote this nice pastoral. Um, he just did a big teaching in Revelation in his church, just slow through, you know, a course of a, of a few months. And then he published it. And it's a really helpful uh, pastoral word. And um, he describes each church based on the description there. And, and he puts it in a way that's really helpful. For example, for Ephesus, he says, this is a letter to a church whose love has faded. And that's a really helpful way to think about it. To a church whose love has faded. And he's not talking about their love for each other. He's talking about their love for him. All right. And here's what he says. So these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And here's one who's talking to you, right? He's walking among the seven golden lampstands. He says, I'm walking with you. And he says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. All very good things. He's praising them, and he's saying, I see you, I see what you're doing, I see what you're going through, and I love it. Then he says, but. This is one of those times I don't like the word but in the Bible, right? Uh, normally it's a wonderful word, but this is a challenge. I mean, it's, it's wonderful because it's true, right? But it's challenging. I have this against you. That you have, a, I wouldn't want to hear Jesus say he has anything against me, you know? It's like we have a problem. We need to talk. <laughs> just, just make it quick. <laughs> you know, just, just get it over with. Rip the band aid off. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you'll fall. Repent and do the works you did at first when their hearts were full of love for Christ, when they were burning, and the things that they did then. He says, you know, you've got a lot of good things, but like, your love for me is cool. You don't talk to me like you used to. You don't get lost in prayer like you once did. What's happened to you? Your heart is drifting away. You know, they had enjoyed, this church had enjoyed some of the best leadership the church had to offer in sort of the first generation, right? They had Paul himself. They had his friends Priscilla and Aquila. They had Apollos, the famous evangelist, super gifted. Um, Tychicus and Timothy. And as Betty was saying, you know, it seems like that John himself had been there for some time, for, for a while, you know? And there's these, these old stories of him sort of being carried around because he's too old to walk, being carried around on a litter, you know, saying, love one another, little children, love one another in Christ, you know. Um, this is what Ephesus enjoyed, this church. And, and there's so many commendations here, right? They're working hard for the gospel. They're, they're being patient under persecution. They have good discernment regarding false teachers. Someone comes in preaching a different gospel, and they're like, uh-uh, I've been taught by Paul. You cannot pull that one on me. You know, I, I know what you're teaching is wrong and false. You need to get out. We're not going to, we don't mess around with the truth here, right? It's such a good trait that you're a charlatan. Get out of here. You know, um, they had lots of energy for the, for the work of God. But their love for Jesus himself had cooled. You know, maybe they'd fallen back on duty and sort of human strength and 
sort of being decent people, loving the truth, but with a human kind of a love. He, as I'm going, I'm doing a book with some guys on Thursday nights. I mean, if you guys want to join, um, you're welcome to come ask me about it um, after tonight. But um, you know, the, the book is called Knowing God. And he's making the distinction. The whole book is about those who know about God and those who actually know God. It's a big difference. And I wonder if Ephesus had simply fallen back and been content with simply knowing about God talking about the Bible, talking about the faith, talking about um, the teachings of their favorite apostles and teachers that they'd enjoyed. Uh, it lost so many good things, and they, they worked hard. They were serious about it, their church life. Um, but their hearts had grown far from Jesus himself. More talking about God than knowing God. And... Um, and notice how serious this is, right? It's, he says, repent and do the works you did at first. And works come from the heart, right? So come back to your love for me and, and do the things you used to do out of love for me. He says, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I will take my presence from you. Amen. Means he's gonna, he would abandon that congregation, or the congregation would fade away and not endure. So the ones who were there that are believing in that generation would obviously he'd be with them. But when the true believers died away and they just had a bunch of busybodies doing church, Christ wouldn't be there anymore. You know? And Ephesus doesn't exist today. Right? There's no church there now. I mean, there are other churches that have come around the area, whatever, but like that original congregation is is not there. Um So, I mean, failing to love Christ, failing to respond to the greatest love of all that's been given to us, right? He doesn't want your duty. God, Christ doesn't want your, your, uh, your good deeds. He doesn't want your sort of notional assent. Oh, yes, I think this is all true. He wants you. <laughs> he wants your heart. He wants your soul and your body. He wants it all. all. His love that was given to you is incomparable. His glory and all the promises and the glory of God and Christ. That is, he's with us himself, right? And we can't even give him the time of day. We don't even care. We don't have warm feelings toward him, you know? This is the kind of thing Ephesus was, 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 was suffering from. And it's a great sin. You know, people try to say, well, how could, uh, this is sort of a, conversation has come up recently in our life here um and this is something we've all wondered about how could a good god kill innocent people or let people die or suffer or whatever right innocent people i got news for you there are no innocent people <laughs> if um you know, all of sin and fall short of the glory of god right <laughs> yeah. non-believers can do really nice things right but if they're not doing it to the glory of God, it's sin. Because it's self-focused. And think of the earth. And God gave us all these glories and all this truth, right? And everything's meant to be done for his glory, mindful of giving thanks to him, right? This, the heart is, is to be worshipped in, in a constant state of worship to God. And anything that's done without that is self-focused. Right? Ultimately. And so, you know, it's kind of like, think of it this way, you know, disinterest of God. Who is more interesting and more worthy of our attention than God? And yet people that are decent and they go, they take care of their kids and they love their relatives and whatever, right? And their friends and, but they do it all without interest to God or without interest for God or deference to God, giving thanks to God or honoring God for it all, in it all, right? It's kind of like, think of it this way. That, that's a real insult, isn't it? Think about it this way. Let's, I still can't get over Charles being the king. So I want to talk about the queen, okay? Let's say, yeah, who wants Charles on the throne? <laughs> not me. Um, I'm not English, so nobody cares about my opinion, but there you have it. Um, let's say you had an audience with the queen. She walks into the room, and you turn your back on her. Mm -hmm. And you start looking for the tea, because you heard they had really nice tea and sandwiches. <laughs> you, know, oh, you know, oh, it's your turn to meet the queen. Can you 
hold on a minute. I'm trying to find this, this little pimento cheese kind of thing, right? Or these lovely little biscuits, you know? Is that not a crime? Is that not insulting to the queen? And you're going to sit here and say that we're all innocent? That just doesn't jive. That doesn't make sense, you know? It is an insult to not give thanks to him and be mindful to him and, and, and worshiping him at all times. It is an insult. And, and it's got to be dealt with, right? It's got to be dealt with. Um, you know, in our confession of sin that we say every Sunday in, in morning and evening prayer, we say it too. Um, i got to look it up now because I've like been going on all kinds of other stuff and I can't do it from memory. But when we confess, yeah, we confess our sins. Yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to conquering in a minute. We're going to camp out in sin here for a second, and then we'll get to conquering. <laughs> um, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we've left undone, the good we should do, right? And here, here's, here, here's the summary of it all. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. Every moment of every day that you spend not loving God with your whole heart is an insult to God. Now, thanks be to God that we have the blood of Christ, right? That forgives us and erases that. But that this is the vulnerability we're in, right? And this is the kind of love he's given us in Christ. And, uh, and that it, it, it deserves the offering of ourselves, body, soul, and mind, right? It warns that it demands it. And if we were to give our whole being, we still would not satisfy the debt of love that we have, right? Um, and so but it's all meant to be joyful. It's, we're mindful of his love to us. Then we respond with love, right? Um, but to not love him is an insult and a sin. Right, and the blood of Christ covers us, but that's the reality we're in. And so, this is a serious deal. Um, and so, then we get to Betty's part. Um, well, first we got it. He says, "I hate you. Hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Who were they? Which I also we're going to hear about them later in the other churches. But it seems like they were groups that that." Um, we're teaching some form of assimilation with pagan life is okay. You could participate in the sort of guild, you know, these professions would come together in guilds and they would have big parties, you know, big feasts. You know, it's kind of like a trade union or something, right? And so, you know, like all the clothing manufacturers would get together and all the whatever, you know, they get together and they would have a local deity and there would be some, and there'd be some sexual things going on and, and food sacrifice to idols would be served and all kinds of stuff, right? And so you're participating in this life. And it seems like the Nicolaitans were saying, you know, it's fine. You can't, you know, you can't escape the world. Just, just go through it. It'll be okay. You, you know, you, at least you're written, you know, at least you're a Christian in the presence. They just think if you weren't there, there wouldn't be any Christians in there, you know. Um, and it's okay to participate in these things. It seems like they were preaching some kind of a compromise as being okay. And, and, and that's absolutely, um, Christ hates that. He says here, I hate that. He says, so I, I give you that. He says, you, you, you hate what they're teaching and what they're doing. And he says, I do too, right? Um, and then he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So receive the message, right? And then to the one who conquers, to the one who perseveres, right? The one who hangs on to this love and receives this message and, and loves the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, with the grace of God helping, just striving for him and reaching for him and loving him, being grateful for him, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Yeah. Yeah, Betty says, yeah, we're definitely in spiritual war, but it has to be conquered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's going to be a major focus of our uh, this conquering language. When we get to the end of all these churches, letters, we're going to look at the conquering. Right? We're more than conquerors, right? That's where we're going. That's where we're going. Um, well, we'll just read it right now. Why not, right? 
Romans 8, 37. See, John had read the book of Romans. He knew what it said. And he brought it. That's one of the advantages of being the last book written in the New Testament, right? You can read all the other ones and, and bring them in and tie it all together. 837 and following. Well, here, we'll just go back. Um, 35. 835, Romans 835. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Remember, Christ is in the midst of the lampstands, right? In the midst of the churches. Who shall separate us? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, all things these churches were experiencing at different times. Shall any of this separate us from the love of Christ? He says, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that doesn't just mean out of separate us from the loving thoughts. We might be far away from him, but he's still thinking love. No, we're united to him spiritually. We are one with him in spirit. It's his life living in us. Nothing can separate that. Nothing. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Um, one commentary that's exceptionally helpful um, has that as the title of his commentary on Revelation. More than conquerors. And every one of these letters has to the one who conquers, I will grant dot, dot, dot. Different promises, different glories, different different strengths. It's just wonderful. So the idea here is to to over to be victorious in the mercy and the grace and the help of God. To be spurred on to turn our hearts to Him. Full strength. Um, I'll I'll close with this. I visited somebody a, a little while back. An older woman, she's homebound. And um, and I always like to bring this one. She's always good for it. I always like to bring a challenge to her. You know, we'll have a nice visit. We'll talk for a while and say, all right, I've got your challenge. You ready for it? She's like, okay, bring it, you know. And um, and she, I said, you know, how's your faith? And she talked about how grateful she is for all the blessings in her life that God has given her. You know, her, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren and, you know, a nice home to live in and and she's the sweetest lady, you know, and she doesn't have a complaint. She said, I have nothing to complain about. You know, she's in her 90s and um, and just has so many blessings and is grateful for it. She has a simple life, but she's just so grateful for it all. And um, I said, all right, here's your challenge. Did you ever realize that, did you ever think about that God gave you all these gifts because he loves you and he wants you to love him back? Not just the blessings, not just the gifts, but he loves you. And these are tokens of his love for you that is meant to be reciprocated. No, I never thought of it that way before. You know, like a little connection. That's sort of what I live for pastorally. These connections are made, you know? And so it's, the, it's, it's God himself. It's Christ himself and his love given to us. And it's meant to be returned. It's just like when someone gives you a present. You don't you don't just look for the present and say, oh, this is great. I've been one of these forever, and then you go on to the next one or whatever, right? If you're doing it right, <laughs> you turn to the person who gave you the present, and you say, thank you so much. I love you. Right? It's a sign of that person's love for you. The gift is just a, a, a means to express your love for this person, right? The gift isn't the point. The people are the point. It's no different with God. Think of all he's given you. You exist. <laughs> your home, your clothing, your food. And that's just the earthly stuff. Everlasting life. Forgiveness of sin. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The very life of Christ united to us. Everlasting life with more joy and profundity than we could ever soak in in a billion lifetimes. 
is all given to us. And the whole earth is ours in Christ. Is it too much to ask that we love him? You know? So let this letter to Ephesus challenge us and, and, and the state of our hearts. And that's just the first of seven. All right? We got more to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what riches you have given us in your word and, and through your son Christ. Uh, we, we, we cannot even imagine. We don't know the smallest fraction of it, Lord. So um, open our eyes to just a bit of your glory and a bit of your love for us and all that you've given. And may we respond in a way that honors you and is appropriate. May we indeed just hold fast in your love, Lord, and, and hold tightly to you. Transform us by this love. And help all the distractions of this world just to fade away and for us to be single hearted, single-minded, solely focused on you and your glory and your power and your love for us. Make us whole, Lord, and in your light may we see light. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Good times tonight. I wondered if it would work out this way. So there you have session three, part A. Is under, the, under your belt. Now we'll do session three, part B next time. And your homework is just to read, read the rest of the letters to the churches. That's as simple as that. Read the rest of the assignment for this section and keep reading the book of Revelation generally, but um, focus especially on um, getting through chapter three. Okay. All right. All of you at home, it's so nice to see you. Don't be afraid to jump in um, at home and, and ask questions. Just unmute yourself and pop in. All right. All right. God bless you all. Have a good night. And, Bye. Uh, see you Bye. soon. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. <laughs>